are in the development of novel elasticity imaging techniques and therapeutic ultrasound methods. And she's been focusing on ultrasound of the brain for drug delivery and stimulation, myocardia, uh, myocardial elastography. And today she will be speaking about uh, applications uh, uh, in the heart, electromechanical and pulse wave imaging, harmonic motion imaging, and she has uh, uh, direct uh, clinical collaborations with the hospitals in the Columbia University uh, Circle and uh, elsewhere. Um, Elisa uh, has been acknowledged by many societies, including uh, her fellowship with the American Institute of uh, Biological and Medical Engineering. She's a member of IEEE MBS, uh, also of IEEE in Ultrasonics, Ferroelectrics and Frequency Control Society, the Acoustical Society of America and the American Institute of Ultrasound in Medicine. Her work has been published uh, in Plenty of, plenty of occasions with more than 225 uh, articles uh, in, in this field. She's uh, an active member of uh, committees and uh, I will just mention that she received multiple awards and these are quite prestigious, like the Career Award from the National Science Foundation, the Nogi Award from the National Institutes of Health, she received the IEEE MBS Technological Achievement Award, and we're very proud uh, to, to have her as one of our awardees, as well as recognitions from the American Heart Association, the Acoustic Society of America, the American Institute of Ultrasound in Medicine, the American Association of Physicists in Medicine, the Water Sculptor Foundation, the Bodosaki Foundation, the Society for Phot uh, Photooptic uh, Instrumentation Engineers, and the Radiological Society of North America. Um, well, just in the interest of time, I'll keep the biography short here because Elisa has many other uh, achievements. Uh, and uh, I will uh, invite her now to take over the microphone and she will speak about electromechanical wave imaging in, for non-invasive and direct mapping of arrhythmias in 3D. And we'll learn about a very important clinical application of work that is being done in our field, that of um, biomedical engineering and image processing. Thank you, Elisa, for uh, uh, accepting our uh, invitation to speak at the seminar. Uh, and uh, the microphone is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And I want to thank the organizers for putting together this very exciting webinar and also for inviting me to share with you some of the work that we've been doing uh, on the heart. Um, I need to share, but the share content is disabled on my part. Is there a way to uh, enable it? It should okay, be great. Oh, sorry for that. Yes, no, no, no problem. All right, let me share with you my presentation. And should go from there just a second. Um, let me see. Um, give it one second, it should come on. All right, can you see this? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you again. Um, so I are we talking about uh, the uh, method of electromechanical wave imaging that we'll be developing over the past few years at Columbia. And we aim for the non-invasive and direct mapping of arrhythmias in three dimensions. Uh, these are some of the disclosures. And uh, the main driving force behind what we're doing is that heart disease is still one of the leading causes of mortality in the US, one out of three deaths. And arrhythmias affect several hundreds of million people worldwide. Um, and uh, there can be focal arrhythmias and non-focal arrhythmias. I'm going to show you here uh, what the regular heartbeat looks like on the, um, let me actually um, put the laser pointer on. Uh, so you have the normal heartbeat on the left uh, where we have the atria activated first uh, followed by the ventricles and we have a normal EKG. But then you have another uh, arrhythmia uh, called the atrial flutter where you have an infinite loop in one of the atria. In this case, it will be the right atrium. Um, and you that shows up on the actual EKG. But it also uh, shows you that locally we can uh, show see that they're actually happening in a particular atrial chamber. 
Now, the top part is available to a cardiologist. The bottom part is something uh, that we want to uh, start image and uh, provide the cardiologist as a result of imaging. So it's very important also to diagnose where it comes, it comes from, because one of the treatments after pharmacological treatment has failed is catheter ablation. And that's uh, with radiofrequency ablation, uh, cryoablation or radiation ablation that has come on uh, more recently. But it's very important to ablate the right chamber. Uh, if the EKG is non-conclusive and it starts saying somewhere in the atria, for example, uh, it's very common that the cardiologist could actually ablate uh, the wrong part of the uh, atrium or the wrong atrium altogether. So we need a non-invasive method to localize uh, the arrhythmia origin prior to ablation and then monitor and assess long-term uh, resolution after ablation. So what is available uh, right now in the clinic? So uh, we have the 12 lead EKG that I'm gonna talk about quite a bit. We actually have a study that we, uh, we were able to compare our imaging to, uh, to 12 lead EKG. Uh, there's a method uh, that uh, is called EK, uh, ECGI, electrocardiographic imaging, where you can reconstruct from inverse problems uh, the, uh, the actual and the MRI and CT anatomy uh, the, the heart itself, the cardiac activation. And then uh, the invasive methodology called electroanatomical mapping or EAM for short, where you have a catheter and uh, at the end, at the tip of it is an electrode that's navigated within the chamber, such as the atrium here. And you can see the small dots, red dots everywhere is where the measurement is. And then uh, we can actually reconstruct uh, the activation map or voltage map of where the atrium was activated. So what we want to uh, develop uh, is something that uh, combines uh, the uh, advantages of EKG and uh, uh, which is basically non-invasive uh, and at the same time uh, be able to, uh, to, to do this non-invasively pre-planning without having to use electrodes. And we call this methodology electromechanical wave imaging. We use a standard uh, ultrasound image uh, to look at the anatomy. And then with high frame rates that I'm going to talk about uh, in a few slides uh, and using the actual phase of the information, we're able to map the atria and ventricular activation, as you see here. So uh, what we wanted to do is see how much of what we see in the EKG, which is uh, several uh, signals like, or curves from each one of these electrodes, 12 electrodes, and then, of course, the electroanatomical mapping that you see here in, uh, in color, which is an invasive procedure, how much of that is related uh, to what we can do with, uh, uh, with electromechanical wave imaging. And hopefully I can, I can show you that uh, when we do have the activation uh, with our imaging technique, we can go back to the EKG, inform it better, and then, of course, uh, make sure that the ablation also works better. Um, so, okay, so first things first, what is this electromechanical activity of the heart? So we're all familiar, of course, with the EKG. Uh, we have the P wave, the QRS, the T wave. Uh, we have the uh, four chambers of the heart, uh, two atria on the top, two ventricles. And then what happens is that the heart is not activated all at once. Uh, you have the P wave uh, that starts with a natural pacemaker, or the sinus nodes, uh, top of the atrium, followed by the entire right atrium activated. Then at the end of the P wave, you have both the right and the left atria activated. And then at the beginning of the QRS, you start having the Purkinje fibers that are innervating the muscle at different, uh, uh, different um, locations, simultaneously activating the two ventricles. So at the end of the QRS, the two ventricles are in synchrony. They're activating together. So the two atria are activating out of phase but the two ventricles are, are, are expected to activate together. And we'll see how in the case of heart failure, uh, the, the technique of uh, cardiac resynchronization therapy uh, brings the ventricles activated together uh, to, um, to reinstate normal function. So if we look at three different locations of the septum here, um, as the actual potential is propagating, uh, we can see that uh, the propagate at slightly different instances. So um, very almost sy synchronously, but also uh, in milliseconds, a little bit uh, uh, delayed uh, from the top of the heart to the bottom of the heart. And then what happens at the, each one of these locations, you also have a mechanical deformation. Very tiny is when the myocytes are actually depolarizing and then they're actually contracting. So it's a very small uh, uh, 
very small deformation, but uh, it is happening. And the other thing that you see here is that there is a delay also the same way, the same way electrically you have a, a delay uh, in activation, you have also mechanical activation. And the two have been known through in vitro models for, um, uh, for a while that uh, they're related through this electromechanical delay, which is about 10 to uh, 20 milliseconds. So if we were able to look at the blue curve propagation, we would infer uh, the red uh, uh, wave propagation. So that's basically the premise behind the entire technique. Uh, so how can we do that? Obviously, things are happening very fast. Now, you can see that the heart is beating uh, pretty fast, right, on the order of, uh, of one hertz, for example. Um, but there's also uh, other phenomena, such as the electromechanical activation, that happen much faster than that, within milliseconds. So in order to do that, we harness one of the advantages of ultrasound, which is high frame rate. But when we call the, talk about high frame rate, it's not uh, 10 or 30 or even 100 frames a second, it's thousands of frames a second. That's how high we have to be. And in fact, what I'm going to show you in the first part of the talk is uh, where we have found that 2,000 frames per second is what you need to capture that uh, activation. And then later on with machine learning at the end of the talk, I'm going to tell you how much we can reconstruct from 2000 back to 100, uh, 25 hertz. Um, so, of course, we have to give away something. And what we give away in this case to get the higher, uh, uh, the higher frame rate is resolution. And, uh, and we sent uh, from the transducer, which is on top, uh, a diverging wave. So this is the worst thing you can do in resolution, of course, uh, you wanna have a focused wave. In this case, it's a completely open wave. Um, but we have found that it is enough uh, to actually uh, be able to measure the phase. So instead of doing very anatomically uh, accurate mapping, uh, you will do very good functional mapping. So, um, and there's interleave, uh, interleaved sequences that you can do for high resolution versus uh, low resolution um, that I'm not going to talk about today, but uh, there's ways to get also a good B mode, a brightness uh, mode image uh, of the anatomy at the same time as functional. And then we do displacement and strain estimation in 1D, that's in the axial dimension. And then one very important aspect is the zero crossing. So the heart has to change phase. It goes from diastole to systole and systole to diastole. We're only looking at the phase where it goes from diastole to systole, so from, uh, from tension to uh, contraction. Um, so that's called depolarization electrically. Uh, uh, for us, it's called contraction. Um, and there is a zero crossing. So that means that you go from positive strain to a negative strain. So positive is relaxation, negative. Uh, is uh, contraction. So we are actually seeking the zero crossing here. And that's another aspect of machine learning that I'm going to talk about how uh, we can actually do this uh, automatically. Now, from the most of the first part of the talk, I'm going to, we're, go, we're doing that uh, manually. Um, and when we do that across the entire uh, uh, heart, uh, we're able to uh, generate what we call isochrones or activation maps. Um, so early activation is in red, late activation is in blue, and you can see how we can, within the QRS, we can see how uh, the actual heart is activated. We can do standard views that are known in echocardiography or cardiac ultrasound, such as the four chamber, three and a half chamber, two chamber, three chamber, and you can see how they're actually uh, performed by rotating the probe around the two um, ventricles. Uh, and then you can reconstruct with uh, by cubic hermite interpolation that we have also published, uh, this uh, more intuitive uh, anatomy of the heart where you have the left ventricle, the right atrium uh, ventricle here. You can also do that in the atria as we're going to do for atrial arrhythmias. Okay, so the most important part, uh, other than the zero crossing that I'm going to touch on at the, uh, the end, uh, towards the end of the talk, is of course the high frame rate. And uh, there's different ways of doing that. Uh, the most intuitive one, uh, I talked about the diverging wave here, the, what we call the flash sequence. Um, and But we also uh, have developed uh, what we call composite technique, which is with ECG gating. So you narrow down the field of view uh, and you borrow from uh, four different uh, con consecutive cardiac cycles that you compose a, a new image. So of course, this one um, does have the, the advantage of uh, preserving the higher spatial resolution, but the disadvantage, especially if you get uh, arrhythmias uh, and paroxysmal arrhythmias, that means not stable but uh, more transient, is the fact that it won't, won't be the most uh, efficient method to use um, in the case uh, where arrhythmias are changing. 
And then we have also uh, uh, published another technique called uh, temporal and equus based uh, acquisition sequence where you change the line rate, not the frame rate, according to the region of the myocardium that uh, is activating the fastest. I'm not going to talk about the last technique. Uh, mainly, we're using the middle technique here, and we have used also in the past uh, the high frame rate. And then, as I said, uh, we are doing the overlay on the anatomy, uh, and then we can reconstruct uh, the isochrones in uh, 3D. Um, all right, so uh, first things first, we did this in large animals, uh, in dogs, and uh, we oriented the transducer here. This is the field of view, or the two ventricles. So left ventricle is the most, the closest to the transducer, which is on top, right ventricle is the most remote. And um, and if you look at just uh, the actual, let me um, get to the point. Uh, if you look at the uh, anatomy itself, it's very difficult for your eye to see, um, naked eye to see the actual wave propagating. Uh, so you see the actual contraction of the heart, but it's very difficult to see transient effects. If we overlay the actual um, uh, electromechanical uh, waves, uh, you can see that you have a red wave, uh, very fast uh, moving red wave, and then a sustained red uh, deformation, which is basically systole, and then a blue wave and a sustained blue deformation, which is diastole. So this is the entire cardiac cycle. Now we're only interested uh, in the systole, in the, in the first part of the depolarization, of the systolic uh, um, uh, phase. Uh, we've done a lot of simulations in uh, collaboration with uh, Natalia Trajanova's uh, group at Johns Hopkins, where she uh, is uh, coupling the electromechanics, uh, the electrical uh, from ionic models, and then uh, coupled with um, diffusion tensor imaging of the heart uh, for a fiber, three dimensional fiber orientation. And then she assumes a specific uh, mechanical component. And with calcium concentration, she navigates between uh, electrical and mechanical activation. And we're able to have very good uh, uh, correlation between simulations on the right and our experiments uh, on the left uh, of the propagating wave uh, uh, throughout uh, the entire two ventricles. So this was one of the first instances where we were able to match both simulations and experiments, but most importantly in simulations, the electrical to the electromechanical. So you can see the third column with the second column matches pretty well. So this was actually our initial hypothesis uh, from the curves that I mentioned to you uh, for electrical wave and uh, mechanical wave. And we could see that the two were actually very, very analogous. So we continued with different types of pacing. And here you see the two ventricles again and two orthogonal views with ultrasound. Uh, and you can see in red the propagation uh, of where we're pacing from to the, on the uh, lateral wall, a uh, basal lateral wall of the heart to uh, and finally having both ventricles uh, activated uh, through thickening. And then we you change the actual pacing location. Uh, red, sorry, blue here is early, red is late. Uh, I showed you already the first map. And then you can do this with two other pacing locations, left ventricular apex now and right ventricular apex, so the tip of the heart as opposed to the uh, top of the heart. Uh, and you're able to identify the earlier uh, activation regions. And then when you stop activating and you let the heart do its, uh, what it does, which is basically activate itself, you can see that two things, one that has multiple origins of where uh, the innervated uh, myofibers uh, are locations are from the Purkinje fibers. And the second one is that it activates much faster, in fact, half uh, at a half the time than what we do with pacing. So we can, uh, so th through this uh, study, we were able to see that we can get the natural pacing of the heart as opposed to the pacing, uh, external pacing of the heart. Uh, we correlated that also with electrical activation. Uh, we placed electrode across uh, different regions of the ventricle, um, and then we activated also uh, either uh, through the apex or the base uh, or sinus rhythm, and we had a very nice correlation between electrical and electromechanical activation in experiments. Now, can we do this only in the ventricles? The answer is no. We can actually do it in all chambers. Uh, this is what we published also very similarly. Uh, we had, uh, in this case, a basket catheter, um, that, uh, uh, which is basically an umbrella catheter that you uh, insert through catheterization in the animal, and then you open up with 64 electrodes, and you measure 
um, the electrical potential across the entire uh, left ventricle. Uh, so this is what you see here in the surface inside uh, this, uh, this shell here. What's outside the shell is actually the four uh, different views of the, uh, of the ultrasound. And then we match the, uh, all of them, uh, both the electrical and uh, the electromechanical. Uh, and we had very good correlations in both the two ventricles, but also the two atrium. Um, and then another aspect of uh, pacing, um, especially uh, if uh, the uh, cardiologists need to pace uh, through the method of cardiac resynchronization therapy, where you place electrodes to the coronary sinus. So that's through catheterization going into the coronaries and then placing electrodes that reactivate and resynchronize uh, the two ventricles. Uh, it's important to see also where the actual electrodes are, are they, and where you get the activation. Is it from the endocardium, which is the inner lining of the myocardium, or the epicardium, which is the outer lining? And we were able to see that, uh, we can see that uh, through our activation, both in the endocardium and the epicardium, uh, we're able to identify whether it was coming from the endocardium or, or the epicardium. Um, so, uh, of course, this is for just a normal heart, and can we do something in pathology? So um, we also have an infarcted model that we have been using over the years, where you ligate one of the coronary arteries, and then uh, you allow the actual um, uh, the actual infarct to set in over a couple of days, um, which uh, relates to a scar. Now, when the scar happens, uh, you're able to see that some of the uh, regions of the myocardium here in red are not properly activated. And I'm just gonna show you later that if you also pace that region, you're able to see this infinite loop of this region that cannot get activated. Uh, and then when you do that, you can see this overall, uh, you scan the, uh, the animal uh, every day uh, during the onset of the scar. Uh, day zero, so we have uh, right before the ligation, you can see that you have very nice synchrony uh, all in red uh, uh, and yellow here between the two ventricles. That's exactly what you want to have uh, in a healthy heart. After ligation, the day one, we can see uh, in black here, this is a region that doesn't activate at all. So this is a after ligation and acute infarction, uh, there's this region that we can identify uh, towards the apex of the heart at the bottom that doesn't get activated. And then, um, and then, uh, uh, let me switch to the laser pointer. Uh, and then day two, uh, you still have a region uh, that's, uh, that, that keeps getting uh, more and more uh, uh, delayed compared to the normal myocardium. And day three, you have uh, the bigger region as the scar is actually starting to form. And we correlated that uh, also with pathology. Um, so, uh, oops, I'm sorry. Um, so can we do this also in uh, 3D? Um, and the answer is yes. Uh, we've been doing uh, this with uh, two-dimensional arrays now in ultrasound. So, so far I showed you uh, the uh, 1D vectorized uh, structure of the elements, of the, uh, of the piezoelectric elements in the array, where you only do uh, different slices and then we reconstruct the three-dimensional structure uh, with uh, interpolation. Uh, we actually can do this also in, uh, in three dimensions in one heartbeat. So we send now a diverging wave and we get a volume uh, we do a delayed sound for beam forming that we did before on GPU, and then we uh, we look at the displacement um, uh, in three dimensions. Uh, and when we do that, we can get uh, strains uh, in one heartbeat across the entire map. And this is after simulation, and then we can do the activation uh, in that one um, heartbeat, the same heartbeat, and we can see which regions of the heart are, are activated early, which is in blue, and which ones uh, at the uh, late. And again, the zero crossing is how we do this uh, as we go from uh, diastole to systole. Um, so we were able to do this in simulations. Um, and then uh, when we, uh, uh, I'm sorry, um, let, me, let me go here. And then we were, uh, when we actually were uh, comparing the electrical activation very similar to what we did in 2D versus electromechanical activation also in 3D, we were able to see very good correlation. Um, so that's in simulations, and when we do um, the uh, the actual uh, infarct, uh, and we're looking at the activation uh, of uh, the left ventricle, we're able to see uh, a similar map. Let me, unfortunately, my computer is. Uh, oops. Um, sorry, I have a lot of movies, and my computer is uh, 
All right, let me go back to this. All right, so um, so we have we pacing now from the infarction region that you see here. Uh, so this creates an infinite loop uh, where the actual region, uh, because it, it's uh, it's a scar, it cannot get activated, and it's uh, resolving to depolarization, resulting in the remaining uh, of the ventricle. And uh, this reentry loop can also be seen uh, through the electromechanical activation. If I can get that to run. Um, sorry. Okay, so then you can get the activation here, early activation and the late activation as the re the actual uh, scar is forming. So that's basically what happens uh, with mechanical with myocardial infarction in particular uh, tachycardia. Okay, so that's all in uh, canine models and simulations. Can we do this in? Uh, a normal uh, and human subjects, a normal or a pathological. Um, so uh, this is what we have uh, as a normal human volunteer. Uh, we were actually now flipping uh, the echocardiogram. So echocardiograms uh, typically shows the atria at the bottom, the ventricles on top, and it's very non-intuitive, uh, especially when you talk to uh, electrophysiologists who are used to a completely different a um, rendering of the heart and overall structure. So we have the right atria and left atrium on top, right ventricle and left ventricle, and we have um, added this illustration of the Purkinje fibers. Again, the natural pacemaker right here, so, uh, the um, AV node, atrioventricular node, uh, right at the uh, tip of the ventricles. And then we have a nice um, uh, isochrone map where you see the right atrium activated early followed by the left atrium, followed by the two ventricles in sync. Uh, and you can look at this through the entire, um, uh, the entire cardiac cycle. Uh, something else that happens in arrhythmias is that uh, you can also get uh, this, um, um, this uh, infinite loops or cycle length. So whether you have an arrhythmic uh, period, uh, periodicity, and we're able to see that uh, through the technique that we have developed called cycle length mapping, uh, we're looking at the frequencies uh, now of these isochrones as opposed to the occurrence activation times, because the activation times don't really make sense when you have an uh, uh, oscillatory uh, arrhythmia. And we can identify uh, the, uh, uh, the highest peaks um, and when they occur. Uh, and then we can see that these peaks uh, switch with the pacing rate. So we were doing this. Um, uh, in uh, in animals uh, where we go from 200 uh, milliseconds uh, to 500 millisecond pacing rate, and we can see that the actual uh, peak is switching. And when we do that, the electrical pacing rate follows nicely with the electromechanical um, uh, frequency or cycle length that we are detecting. So going back to humans uh, and something that, that uh, we have been wanting to do, uh, the cardiologist uh, you know, for us, the ventricles in imaging are so easy to image because they have very thick walls, especially the left ventricle. Uh, you can see that any resolution, but of course, the most common arrhythmias are atrial, and those are the typical ones that, uh, that are treated in the clinic. So, uh, but the atria are very thin, have very thin walls, they're very small chambers, uh, but of course, they're most relevant uh, in the clinic. So you see here, this is uh, basically uh, the state of the art, 12 lead EKG. So you place uh, 12 leads around the, the uh, sternum of the patient, the chest, uh, and each one of them contains information either from the atria or from the ventricles. And then uh, there's no real imaging technique other than that. So you have to, the actual um, uh, electrophysiologists, we have to reconstruct this uh, and, and, and uh, be able to identify going from one curve to the other where the arrhythmia is coming from. So we offer the, this type of imaging where we can actually let them know whether what they infer from the 12 lead EKG uh, was actually where uh, the early activation or, or arrhythmia origin was. And this is the atrial flutter with the infinite loop here in the left atrium uh, that starts from uh, this region abnormally. So normally, again, the activation is the right atrium for sinus rhythm. Now, this one is starting from the left atrium. That's called the left atrial roof flutter. Uh, that's because you have the roof or the top of the left atrium that's activated first. Um, on the ventricle side, uh, we have what's called, uh, this is a case of preventricular contraction. Uh, this can be um, congenital, um, and uh, sometimes it has, again, to be treated uh, with RF ablation. 
Um, and in this case, uh, we are showing here uh, at the same exact patient had one heartbeat, a sinus rhythm, and you can see how the two ventricles are very nicely activated in sync. And the next heartbeat had a preventricular contraction. This is very common, and we're very lucky to actually uh, uh, have these two beats consecutive. And you can see now the map is completely different from having these two ventricles, um, uh, sinus rhythm, uh, having an early activation in this region of the left ventricle. Um, so, uh, and going back to the atria, uh, another arrhythmia is endotachycardia, uh, where you have one region of the atrium that's uh, uh, activated faster than the rest of the atrium, and it's causing uh, it's causing problems, of course, and changes in the EKG. And we can identify it here, uh, uh, right on the roof of the right atrium. Uh, and uh, and this on the bottom are two other cases of mitral uh, atrial flutter. So mitral is close to the mitral uh, mitral valve, and you can see here on the right. Uh, where you have the early activation in the atrial septum and then looping around uh, the actual uh, mitral valve, close to the mitral valve uh, region. So for planning, um, in this particular case, uh, this study that I'm going to show you, uh, we had 12 lead EKGs. So now to predict uh, where the actual arrhythmia is coming from after the 12 lead EKGs, there are two algorithms uh, that are um, used. Um, the Borsma algorithm and the Aruda algorithm. In this particular case, uh, we actually use the Borsma because correctly predicted, especially uh, the uh, origin um, in the left uh, uh, in the left lateral uh, area. And um, and then our ground truth is the ablation region. So this all the subjects that we enrolled were actually undergoing RF ablation. So we knew that the, when the ablation was successful, we knew which region was actually arrhythmic because once it's ablate, ablated then the arrhythmia goes away. So first we did it before ablation, similar to what I showed you, we identified in this case, um, the accessory pathway uh, in this particular uh, area uh, of uh, arrhythmia called uh, Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, uh, and only pediatric patients will be enrolled here, um, where they catheterize and then ablate the region uh, to stop the arrhythmia. So then we looked at after arrhythmia on the right, uh, where we were able to see successful ablation brings us two ventricles uh, back to in sync and eliminates this region of early uh, arrhythmia. So we published this uh, um, uh, a couple of years ago now, and uh, the next thing we wanted to do is uh, to see whether we can how whether we can co confirm what we see on the 12 lead EKG. So we enrolled 55 subjects, um, and uh, we were able to. Um, uh, confirm uh, the atrial tachycardia, atrial flutter, so these two atrial arrhythmias, similar to what I showed you before, um, and then we also did um, the ventricular arrhythmias, again, what I showed you before, the Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome and the premature ventricular uh, contraction. We put it all together, and uh, uh, what we actually saw was not only did we, did we compare well against EKG, but we actually uh, had a better accuracy, so the two cardiologists um, sorry, the five cardiologists that were uh, assessing uh, blindly, so this was a double-blinded study uh, uh, with the EKG alone and the electromechanical uh, wave alone, 96% uh, of the time uh, there was uh, uh, the uh, electromechanical wave imaging accurately predicted that, and the uh, EKG predicted 71% of the time. So we think that there is a real role of this technology and to be able to better diagnose and better plan procedures uh, for arrhythmic patients. Um, so, and the last thing I wanna talk about before I get to more of the machine learning approaches is uh, the cardiac resynchronization therapy. So this happens typically uh, when uh, the heart undergoes uh, heart failure and it cannot produce the right ejection fraction. Uh, and that, of course, may lead to a successive failure of other organs. So it's very important uh, to bring the heart back to, um, back to normal function. The way it's done, as I mentioned, is by placing two leads uh, into the ventricle. So you can see here, for example, this is uh, right ventricular only RV, left ventricular pacing only, and biventricular. Uh, so the biventricular or bi V has uh, two uh, leads, uh, one on the right ventricle, one on the left ventricle. And the two activate uh, at the same time uh, and they bring back the synchrony in the two ventricles. So it's very important to assess 
um, uh, proper uh, placement and also making sure that this uh, uh, this uh, CRT uh, treatment uh, works for the patient. Now this works 60% uh, of the time typically, uh, but 30 to 40% of the time uh, it does not work, and there are patients that are actually having this uh, this uh, implanted devices without having efficient um, uh, efficient uh, uh, reversal of, of uh, their um, uh, heart dysfunction. So we wanted to see uh, during the implantation of the electrodes whether we're able uh, to see that. And this is the, on the day of the implant when the actual uh, cardiologist is implanting those. And we had two patients, uh, patient one, which is a 66 year old female that had the left bundle branch block under heart failure. And uh, we could see that um, in the two uh, regions after uh, ablation, um, she actually didn't have, so this is the, my, the um, myocardial resynchronization rate uh, percentage. So how much of the heart was actually brought back uh, to resynchrony uh, between the two ventricles? And we could see that uh, we, she had 57% of the heart uh, reinstated. Um, and the QRS also showed that she was not a non-responder. Uh, the injection fraction was low. So this was a non-responder. Uh, the second patient, you can see how the two ventricles are very much in sync. Um, so the top one, you can see the left ventricle is delayed compared to the right ventricle. So the left bundle branch block in patient one uh, is not actually uh, paced correctly. Here we can see that we get 98% of the myocardial resynchronization, and we're able to get the ejection fraction also uh, up. Um, so, and this is basically uh, something that uh, we're publishing this year. Uh, showing that we could probably inform uh, the actual uh, position so that they can reposition um, the electrodes at the day of the implantation so that the patients can have uh, a higher response. Okay, the last part of my talk is going to be on two different things that we want to use machine learning on uh, to be able to improve some of the uh, more manual uh, approaches first, and then also the frame rate issue that we have uh, with uh, standard ultrasound scanners. Uh, so the first thing is, as I said, uh, so far we've been identifying the zero crossing uh, with uh, manual selection. So what happens is that you have uh, the strain here of the heart, very low strain on the order of 0.02%, and you go from maximum strain here, um, uh, and as you enter, uh, let me, as you enter systole, uh, you have the first zero crossing, and sometimes you have a second zero crossing, um, depending on where you are in the heart and how the heart is tethered. Now. Um, one of the complexities of this technique is that electrically uh, the depolarization happens, uh, is, you know, almost instantaneously, but the mechanical uh, resulting uh, contraction uh, has to do also with the rest of the myocardium and the rest of the chamber because it's being tethered. So sometimes, depending on how close you are to the atria or how close you are to the general function of the heart, you may get a second zero cross. So, you, so we have this negative slope that we're always looking at. Um, and uh, and we, we're gathering feature collections for our classifier. So the feature collections are the spatial coordinates uh, within the mask. So here uh, in blue, you see the left ventricle and the right ventricle. And what I'm showing you here is just one region of the left ventricle, the lateral wall, and how that strain changed. We're looking at the slope of the zero crossing location, either the first zero crossing uh, or the second, if that exists. We're looking at the maximum strain before the first zero crossing, the minimum negative strain um, after the first zero crossing, um, and then the time points, at which point the actual <clears throat> we reach the maximum strain and at which point we reach the minimum strain after uh, zero crossing. And then we have two types of zero crossing. Um, so we have uh, the textbook case um, where you have a one zero crossing from diastole switching to systole, negative strain, uh, and that happens 40% uh, of the time. So, and then if you have two uh, or more uh, zero crossings, uh, you have multiple options, you have one and two. So we looked also at how the classifier uh, handles that if you have more than one zero crossing, which is more common. 60% of the time we have this occurrence. So uh, for ground truth, uh, we use the WPW, so the Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome with the accessory pathway that I mentioned. Uh, I forgot to mention the accessory pathway happens uh, where you have this abnormal 
connection between atria and ventricles. So the atria are activated uh, and then part of the ventricle is also activated. So that's basically the syndrome um, WBW. So we only look at, looked at that uh, in 14 uh, pediatric and 10 adults. Um, and then we look at also five patients in sinus rhythm uh, that uh, occurred after the WBW was successfully ablated. And then we also looked at Canon experiments that we've done similarly, uh, where we had uh, epicardial uh, electro electroanatomical mapping validation in the left ventricle. So we knew that this was actually also validated uh, in, in the Canons in, uh, in uh, six, six left ventricular based locations. Uh, we had cases that are previously manually processed, a lot of them similar to the all the clinical study that I showed you before. Uh, so we had the ground truth, again, with the mapping. Uh, so we had overall 35 cases from that manually processed, four different views, uh, echocardiographic views, 150 points uh, at which we had uh, the strain, and overall 21,000 temporal strain curves labeled. So that's how we, uh, we trained with 70 training sets and 30 to validate. Um, we also had data labeling uh, for the zero crossing, uh, whether we had one zero crossing or not. And then uh, the evaluation metrics was the precision, so which is basically the true positives over the sum of true positives and false positives, um, and the, or the recall, which is the true positives uh, over the sum of true positives and false negatives. So what, the precision would tell us what portion of a prediction was true, and the recall would, would tell us how many true zero crossing we found. We had uh, we compared uh, three different classification models uh, with supervised learning uh, for the best zero crossing candidates. The first one was logistic regression, which is a uh, generalized linear model, uh, and it was the most simplistic reference baseline for us. Uh, the SVM uh, support vector machine, which is uh, shows the optimal hyperplane to separate categories, and then finally the random forest. Uh, which is an ensemble uh, learning method um, with multiple decision trees. Uh, again, when we had the stable zero crossing, we had the selection of the uh, of the one zero crossing, and then for the if we had more um, than one zero crossing, so we had uh, more than one, uh, we had two voting options. One was with the highest probability, um, uh, where uh, we. Uh, we basically have the highest probability of uh, finding the zero crossing. And the other one with the probability threshold, uh, where we set a threshold and we would see uh, whether the right zero crossing was, uh, was selected. And these are some of the results for the precision recall curves. Um, uh, first, we evaluated on the human validation data sets, and we can see that uh, by far the logistic uh, regression uh, is doing uh, the worst. Um, but uh, the SVM and the random forest are very um, equivalent uh, with the evaluation of the human testing uh, after evaluation of the human validation. But when we evaluated um, uh, on uh, the uh, human uh, data set, uh, sorry, the Canon data set, we could see that uh, the SVM was failing uh, much faster than the random forest. So overall, the random forest, uh, we found it to be uh, the most uh, reliable. Um, and then when we uh, checked on the with the left ventricular paced canine, so that we knew the location uh, because we knew where we were pacing, and we also had the the ground truth of the activation, electrical activation. Again, the logistic regression failed to identify this area of pacing. Uh, the SVM and the random forest were equivalent. Uh, then we changed um, the number of data sets, and then we could see again the two uh, SVM random forest with random forest being much more correlated with uh, the manual one. And then finally, with more points, we could see that there was persistence of the random forest uh, uh, performance, especially with the threshold and recall higher than uh, 40%. Um, this, the second uh, aspect that uh, is, uh, we're facing now is the fact that uh, uh, most card echocardiography scanners are actually having much lower frame rates uh, than what we have been using. And we wanted to see whether random forest that had really high performance in the previous study would actually allow us to infer um, uh, some of the frames that we may not have with, our, uh, with, our clinical, with clinical scanners. So, so far I've showed you 
uh, what we can do with the research scanners, research ultrasound scanners that are open architecture. We can do our own beam forming uh, with diverging waves, uh, but this is not something that uh, typical manufacturers will allow us to do. So, uh, so in this case, instead of doing the 2000 frames a second, we also did 500, 250, and 125. So there was a down sampling pipeline. Um, we had one uh, EWI acquisition uh, on the healthy volunteered. Uh, we looked at a uh, decimation rate of 4, 8, and 16. And then uh, we also adjusted uh, the uh, cross correlation uh, region of search uh, to be able to compensate for some of the quality uh, in the, in the um, frame rate uh, decimation uh, that was lost. And then, uh, and then we looked at uh, how the two, uh, how the two compensated uh, for the e e EWI uh, isochron map. So we knew uh, our ideal at 2000 Hertz. So this is a case of a normal uh, sinus rhythm. So the two ventricles are in sync. And then we have, um, we decimate the frame rate from uh, 2000 all the way to 125. And you can see how the isochron is affected. Uh, we also adjust the search range uh, from um, the region where we actually search uh, for the uh, strain uh, from 4 to 16. And you can see that here, uh, when we look at uh, as the actual uh, frame rate is decreasing um, our uh, zero crossing uh, uh, selection, we're able to see that uh, some of the uh, inaccurate zero crosses are happening uh, in specific uh, views versus others with a three chamber view actually being the most resistant uh, to uh, uh, deterioration from frame rate. So overall, uh, 500, 500 frames per second uh, was consistent with the baseline. So 92% of the zero crossing with random forest uh, were actually selected correctly. Um, but uh, at 125 Hertz, which is actually the typical frame rate of clinical scanners, we still have work to do. 50% uh, of selected uh, zero crosses were false positives. So, um, so could, what can we learn from, how can we use machine learning to uh, lower the frame rate, uh, sorry, with random forest? So, sorry, this froze on me. Um, so the last thing I'm gonna show you, uh, sorry, this was not with random forest, I'm sorry. The next one, there's a little bit of a delay. Um, let me just, um, okay, I got it back, I think. Um, I need to, yeah, I got a fr frozen screen, uh, bear with me. Okay. Um, I'm gonna have to reshare uh, just a second because, uh, give me one second. Sorry about that. <clears throat> Um, um, okay. Um, all right. So there was a delay. So I was showing you this random forest classifier um, that we're able to uh, compare to minor selection. Uh, and we can see that at 500 Hertz, uh, and especially with the recall more than 20%, we were able to identify at least the right ventricular walls. The left ventricular wall, especially the most lateral, we're losing that. Compared to 125, that was uh, erroneous. So um, in conclusion, um, I showed that uh, the high precision strain imaging can be a uh, uh, can be um, can be achieved at high temporal resolution through electromechanical wave imaging, uh, so that we can map the electromechanical uh, activity of the heart. Uh, we highly correlated with electrical activ acti activation, uh, and we have uh, shown this in both small. I didn't show the mice. Uh, I didn't have time in large animals, and of course humans. Uh, all four chambers have been validated in both atrium and ventricles. Uh, and we've shown both focal and non-focal arrhythmias to be mapped. Uh, we compared against 12 BKG, 
And we also uh, have uh, identified uh, responders on the day of CRT um, implantation. Uh, with uh, SVM and Random Forest, we show that that will form logistic regression for zero crossing selection. Uh, SVM also exhibited a 5% drop in precision, uh, especially in the canines. And Random Forest overall had the best performance. Um, and uh, the, this also the Random Forest allowed us to get a lower uh, out, down to 500 hertz um, act activation of zero cross with this high zero crossing confidence. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, my entire group uh, and all the collaborators uh, and, of course, our uh, sponsors and you for your attention. Thank you. And I'm sorry for all the technical <laughs> technical no uh, yeah. issues. Thank you very much, uh, Lisa. Thank you for the uh, wonderful talk. Now we can uh, uh, open uh, to the uh, attendees to see uh, if there are any questions. Uh, you can actually feel free to uh, post your question in the QA section, or you just actually type, type a small, uh, a, a short sentence. We can uh, enable you so you can uh, uh, directly speak to uh, Alisa to ask your question. I see uh, Winning Li from uh, University of Hong Kong. Uh, if you just want to say hello or do you have a question, I can actually unmute you. So you're unmuted. If you want to ask anything, you can um, ask. Oh, thank you very much <laughs> uh, so for the great talk. Uh, actually, <laughs> I was trying to answer to her earlier question about the audio problem. Uh, okay. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I thought, yeah, I will save my question later. Yeah, thank you, the host. Thank you. Any questions from the uh, audience? You can just uh, type uh, uh, anything so I can see you have a question. I will unmute you. You can ask. Or you can raise your hand. I think there's a raise hand uh, function there. Uh, feel free to do that. So maybe I can uh, start with the uh, first question, Alisa. So, yeah, it, it, it's a great uh, talk. So um, I see actually you have uh, put in a lot of efforts in the past, uh, more than decade efforts into uh, this uh, exciting research, very important, right? right? You have done actually the first non-invasive imaging of the uh, uh, the, the heart electri uh, electrical activity there. It's amazing. Um, so what actually are the main uh, technical challenges you have been uh, uh, conquered during the process. And right now, I see actually you have starting from the simulation to the uh, 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 in situ uh, uh, experiments, now moving to the clinical study. What is the main challenge you see actually in this uh, translational process? That's an excellent question. Um, and so the main problem is um, the fact that, uh, you know, we have two different clinical experts. We're dealing with um, non-invasive echocardiography, so cardiologists who use ultrasound on a daily basis uh, to diagnose heart problems. And then you have on the other side, um, interventional cardiologists that don't use ultrasound, they use catheters and electrodes to look at the electrical function. So uh, at least in the US, uh, it's very compartmentalized, meaning that you have people who are only interested in the mechanical activity and uh, in the in the clinic, so wall motion, for example, um, uh, you know that uh, changes in the case of ischemia or infarction, uh, and then on the other you have uh, electrode placement, uh, you know either EKG or also intracardiacally, uh, where you look at actual potential and activation maps. So we're trying to bridge these two worlds, and uh, and we have found that it's much harder than we thought because it's almost disruptive. Uh, you have no predicate really that bridges the two. Um, in fact, no real, uh, you know, no electrophysiologist will ask you about uh, the mechanical uh, activation of the heart and no uh, non-invasive cardiologist is going to ask you about the electrical um, activation. Um, and in fact, uh, as some of you may know, if you have that expertise, electrophysiologists typically paralyze the heart if, in animals, <laughs> especially those working with optical imaging, because the, the mechanics uh, provide artifacts on electrical conduction and vice versa. 
So yeah, we, we're finding that we actually uh, have to redefine a new world um, where the two are important because, you know, because they, they are, you know, they coexist in the heart. It's not one or the other. You need both to have the heart stay alive. So that's basically what we're finding. And the other aspect is, of course, what I said at the end, which, what, you know, manufacturers need low frame rates. Um, they, they will never sacrifice the resolution like we do. Uh, they will need hundreds of frames uh, at the most um, per second. So I think this is a, a real aspect of machine learning that we are uh, very carefully looking at to try to salvage some of what we see a thousand frames a second. Great, yeah, thank you. Yeah, th that sounds very challenging. Usually we deal with uh, clinical partners only actually one subject area, right? The sole partner. So, <laughs> right now, exactly. to create a new world with the two, uh, putting the two parties together. Yeah, great, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Any yeah. other questions from the uh, uh, audience or from the uh, our panelists? Okay. Maybe Wayne Ning can ask one more, the question yeah, that you wanted right. to ask. <laughs> okay, you are now <laughs> unmuted. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> I was too nervous. Um, uh, so uh, actually, thank you, Alisa, for bringing me up this uh, machine learning thing um, for let's say ultrasound imaging. So I'm just curious, like, uh, what do you think? Like, uh, how? Well, the the use of machine learning and how reliable. And to what extent do you think that machine learning can do uh, for ultrasound imaging as we, yeah, especially I really like your idea of, I say, going back to probably the commercial systems, which only offer a few, let's say, not a few hundred, but just a hundred frames per second for, uh, the, for the cardiovascular system. Yeah, and then now uh, the machine learning or say deep learning um, is still not explainable yet. So then how, how we should really like uh, embrace uh, this um, really, I say, prosperous machine learning and um, <laughs> to really promote ultrasound imaging. Yeah, that's an outstanding question, and thank you. Um, you know, Wei Ning uh, was my first student that graduated, uh, <laughs> so she has uh, I don't, I, she has a dear, uh, um, you know, she's a dear to my heart. No pun intended. So, um, so basically. Machine learning, and I'm not I'm not an expert, and we have experts, I'm sure, uh, on this panel and also as an audience. Uh, it has to be carefully used. Uh, it's not uh, what I say. You know, you just um, you know cross your fingers and hope your machine learning works. That's not the right <laughs> uh, you know the right approach. What we have seen is that if you if you have uh, the right classifier and you train it properly. Uh, potentially unsupervised, right? So you don't overfit. So all these different elements, um, and you also feed it with something that you know well. So that means the zero crossing is something that we've been doing, as you know, uh, for decades. So we know exactly what we need to know. We knew that where the zero crossing was once, where the zero crossing was twice, the ambiguity of the zero crossing. So we have to basically teach the classifier and train it properly so that the right solution comes out. If you have no idea what you're doing uh, and you just say, I don't know, there must be some ischemia here, or there must be some arrhythmia, and I'm just gonna feed it one billion B mode images. And because it's one billion, it's gonna, it's gonna speed out the right answer. I think uh, most people have moved away from that wishful thinking because uh, it's, uh, you know, like my PhD advisor used to say, garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> it doesn't matter what uh, you do with your classifier. Maybe, maybe the most magnificent classifier out there, uh, but you feed it thing, you feed it training data uh, that are actually uh, ambiguous and uh, and have basically no, you know, no um, classification uh, value. So it's very important to do this correctly, and especially ultrasound images themselves, because they're so variable. Uh, it's, ma it's manually, uh, as you guys know, handheld imaging. The actual sonographer or echographer can change their views. You can have a completely different view. If you don't know how to train uh, the acquisition and select the right views, 
uh, that's not that's going to be an, an issue. You're going to be looking at the motion of the handheld imaging more than anything else, which is not not correct. OK, thank you. I, I see actually uh, Marius posed a question. Um, Marius, do you want to ask yourself? Or... Yeah, maybe I can. Yeah, sure. I'm, 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 I'm happy. I'm happy to to say that. I mean, I put it in the in, in yeah. the chat already. But uh, Elisa, since you're working with non-invasive right imaging techniques and ultrasound, yeah. of course, I cannot stop thinking about how useful <laughs> this is in pediatrics. And I was wondering, what is your direction in 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 that area of pediatric care? So you saw our pediatric study, right? With uh, yeah. with the uh, Wolf Parkinson White. Uh, that that was the most beautiful images because as you, if you ever see uh, sonographic images of, of children, they're just beautiful. Why? Because they have shallower hearts. They don't have as much fat um, typically, and you get really exquisite resolution. And you can afford to have even higher frame rate because you don't have to go that deep. So you can reduce your field of view and have really nice frame rates. Uh, so pediatric patients are our best, I mean, the best suited for this technology. And um, so we have been also asked to do this in obstetrics. <laughs> so because, you know, of course, you, you know, the advantage of ultrasound uh, here, especially pediatric patients, is uh, the fact that you have no ionizing uh, at, uh, at the bedside uh, as opposed to MRI, where you have to wheel them in to the MR scanner and uh, have them uh, try to stay uh, put and stable uh, for uh, for you know a few minutes, if not hours. Uh, in this case, you can get really good images um, of, uh, and if you're doing machine learning, you can get multiple uh, images uh, also in, in in the kids uh, and even in the womb. Uh, in the, you can actually get, uh, this is the only technology that potentially can get activation of the heart um, in, in fetal imaging. And, and do, do you think for, for that reason, I mean, I'm thinking probably for fetal imaging, this could be in a way more straightforward incorporated into some kind of a screening protocol where you get lots of data, but for pediatric patients where cardiac conditions, yes, do happen, rheumatic heart diseases are, are, are maybe more, more, more common, but you do not have the same volume, right, for, for training machine learning uh, uh, algorithms from children. But don't forget that there's also the different views that you can get, uh, potentially. Mm -hmm. uh, it's true, it's not the same volume, but, you know, we have to be careful about what volume we're talking about. I mean, in this case, we used about 20,000, uh, and that was in, I think, uh, yeah, that was about uh, 15 pediatric patients and also 10 adults. So, we found it to be sufficient. Yeah, you don't need hundreds and thousands of patients necessarily. As long as they have a similar pathology and a similar type of condition, not just branching out to any condition. Um, and again, I mean, we can pull together from different centers worldwide. It doesn't have to be uh, just that. I mean, we're doing only our hospital, but if you have the same protocol, uh, and the same scanner, because most of the time people have similar scanners, you know, either Philips or G, for example, uh, that could be done. I think with the set protocol, you can get enough images. Thank you very much. Sure. Yeah, thank you, Alisa. So, yeah, that's a very interesting topic. I, I believe actually we have a lot more to talk about uh, for the sake of the time. We probably have to uh, cut off here. So, thank you very sure. much for the uh, wonderful talk. I'd also like to thank uh, all the uh, panelists and all the attendees for um, attending the event today. Uh, we'll have more such events in the future. Um, yeah, please join us. So thanks again, everyone. Thanks, Elisa. Hi. Yeah, Mary. Thank you for having me. And thank you, Pinkun and Ahmed, for organizing this. And I'm, yes. I know that you already have the second talk <laughs> right planned. So uh, please. Uh, uh, Keep an eye on your inboxes. More information coming soon. Uh, this is very exciting, and thanks again for uh, organizing something that can have such a large outreach uh, in our community. Great, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.